let's get down to what actually works in the world of muscle building supplements. There's a lot out there that could work if you like really look at these little harebrained studies. Let's talk about the evidence, but also let's talk about a couple things that are kind of looming around the corner in the world of research. We can't always just look at what's proven with tons of data. We do have to get curious about some new things. Now, every single thing I'm talking about today is gonna be something that you can pick up cheap. And that's kind of the beauty of what actually works. It's not some fancy schmancy stuff, it's stuff that works. And I'll lead right in with the first one that you could probably guess, but I'm gonna say it anyway, and that's creatine. However, you don't need five, 10 grams of creatine. The research is starting to show all you need is enough to kind of saturate your muscles, which might be one gram, it might be two grams, it might be three grams, and just straight, simple, cheap creatine monohydrate is all you really need. The interesting thing with creatine is it doesn't necessarily build mass. It's an energy building supplement. So it helps you build energy, helps you build strength. Okay, but with strength typically comes mass and it might help you improve recovery. Now what's cool is we've got brand new data that's come out like end of 2022 published in the journal Nutrients. What we saw was that there was some data indicating there is a decrease in leucine oxidation. Leucine is the primary amino acid associated with anabolism, with building muscle and even preserving muscle. If you have leucine oxidation, you're breaking down muscle. So a reduction in leucine oxidation demonstrates that you are preventing or at least limiting the amount of muscle breakdown. So building muscle is always a balance of protein synthesis, muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. You may not worry about the muscle protein breakdown, but you're in a state of breakdown much more than you are in a state of synthesis. So if you can reduce the amount that you're breaking down, that is arguably even a bigger lever than trying to increase synthesis. Also with this study, there were strong reductions in 3-methylhistidine, which is a marker that's associated with overall catabolism. So when we see a reduction in methylhistidine, we know we're breaking down less muscle. Bottom line is start with a couple grams. If you're worried about water retention, one to two grams, try it. That's about what I take and I don't retain water from it. Okay, let's move into this next one that is super wild and there's some new crazy evidence that's really interesting that compares rats and humans in the same study, talking about vitamin D. Okay, so here's the deal with vitamin D. First, I wanna talk about a study that was published in Renal Nutrition that took a look at some people that were going through hemodialysis. So they were relatively sedentary. So this is what's cool. Vitamin D3 might be really good for people that aren't heavily resistance training, but just don't wanna lose muscle mass. So they took 49 people, put them on vitamin D while going through dialysis, and 30 people did not. What they found is that when they took a look at their thigh muscle mass, those that were taking the vitamin D that were relatively sedentary retained a lot more muscle than those that did not. And it has to do more than likely with insulin sensitivity and how vitamin D influences insulin secretion. Insulin, although we demonize it a lot, it is critical for anabolism and for maintaining muscle. So if you have proper insulin secretion and proper insulin sensitivity, you can retain and preserve and even build muscle better. But now let's look at this other study that's really cool newer stuff. This was published in Molecular Metabolism, took a look at rats and humans and their vitamin D receptor. So in rats, they overexpressed the vitamin D receptor, meaning they created a lot more receptors for vitamin D in an unnatural way. And they did this for 10 days. They saw when they did that, the rats had more muscle, they had more strength, all by just increasing vitamin D receptor. That's wild, okay, but that's rats. We can't take that to the bank. It's interesting, but can't 100% take it to the bank. So with humans, what they did is they monitored their vitamin D receptors. They monitored how much they were being expressed and they put them on a resistance training regimen. They found when they resistance trained, the more that they expressed vitamin D receptors, the more vitamin D receptor they expressed, the more muscle they built, and the more strength they had. So we combine this data with the rodent model data where we can get a little more granular with the more observational data. We're like, whoa, vitamin D is doing something cool. Now in the rats, they saw ribosomal uh, biogenesis, they saw muscle protein synthesis, and they saw hypertrophy, so anabolic signaling. So they saw all these like molecular changes. So the bottom line is, I usually say like three to 4,000 IUs of vitamin D, but I would honestly recommend more like cod liver oil. So you get the vitamin A and you get the omega-3 with it too. And you're not taking the risk of a potential synthetic. I don't hate vitamin D. I think it's important and it's better than having low levels. But I always question like, 
why are we all so low in vitamin D, even if we're outside? There might be something else going on. So let's just try to get it from Whole Foods whenever possible, just because we don't know, right? This next one is so cheap and so simple. Okay, and the journal Endocrinology Metabolism published a wicked cool paper. I'm talking about essential amino acids. Take your branched chain amino acids and throw them in the trash. EAAs have more what you need. They're your essentials. But why are they so cool for muscle building? Well, this study took a look at chronic use and acute use of essential amino acids on lean body mass, strength, and muscle protein synthesis. They saw immediately upon acute usage of EAAs, there was a significant increase in muscle protein synthesis, just a big spike. But what, then what they found over the course of three months, just using seven and a half grams of EAAs per day, it increased the baseline of muscle protein synthesis. So not just an acute spike when they had it, their whole baseline changed. Their entire being of muscle protein synthesis was more. Could you have achieved this arguably with just more protein? Yes, you probably could. It's all about the leucine availability. So full disclaimer, yeah, you could probably increase your protein intake and get there. But if you can also get there, maybe you're not hungry. Maybe you can't have protein all the time. EAAs are certainly cheaper, but you can also sort of EAA or leucine spike your own diet to increase the availability of leucine. Now, it seems to have induced anabolism through what is called the IGF-1 phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase pathway. It's a mouthful, you don't need to remember it. What it means is as basically indirectly helping the facilitation of insulin and growth hormone to ultimately produce muscle via IGF-1 at the right time. So this is a fancy way of saying leucine stimulates IGF-1, just like protein would. Now, I also put a link down below if you like protein powders. The one that I use occasionally is Sun Warrior. Now, I rotate between whey protein powder and plant-based protein powder because I don't like to use the same thing over and over and over again. The thing I like about the Sun Warrior one is A, there's a cool discount down below, 20% off whatever you want from Sun Warrior, but their active protein line has all these essential amino acids in it, but it also has fiber, it also has enzymes, and it also has probiotics. So it's all there to make you not feel bloated. Usually when you have a protein shake, especially a plant-based one that's gonna have pea protein or pumpkin seed protein, you might get bloated because you don't have the enzymatic function. So that link down below, I just highly recommend them Full disclaimer, like yes, they're a sponsor on this video. You do not have to purchase them, but I highly recommend it if you are trying something new and you want a more full spectrum protein shake that also has nutritional value to it, not just straight up whey protein. Now again, if you like whey protein, that's totally cool. You don't have to do this, but I recommend alternating. I go one day whey, one day plant-based, one day whey, one day plant-based. So I'm getting different aminos, different protein, and also just changing it up. So 20% off discount link right below this video in the top line of the description. That also gets you 20% off anything you want from their site. So check it out down below. Okay, it's all about the pump, right? All about those vasodilators. We see them in pre-workouts everywhere. Get that pump, get that pump. Does the pump actually do anything? Let's address this first and foremost. From a physics standpoint, bringing more blood volume into your muscle could only result in good things. Like that's more intracellular leverage. That's more volume. That is literally more leverage to lift more weight. Okay, if you like how you look in the gym, if you look in the mirror and you have a pump and you're more motivated, sure, that is worth something. It's certainly not a detriment, and it's pretty awesome when you look at the research on how a vasodilator like nitric oxide, like NO2 supplements, actually work. So there's a study published in Journal of Physiology that talked about sort of the mechanism. So it increases sort of the supply demand for oxygen. Now, how it does this is it ends up relaxing the smooth muscles that are in your arteries. So your arteries relax and more blood gets to the muscle. This obviously delivers more oxygen, so you arguably have more energy, but you definitely have more blood flow and potentially more nutrient delivery. Now we've seen evidence with beetroot juice doing this for endurance, but as far as strength and hypertrophy, we have to get a little hairy. So we've seen the beetroot juice stuff really helping endurance and helping blood flow there. But let's look at some rodent model stuff to understand the muscle side. So there's a study published in Skeletal Muscle that found that then rodents, when there was a reduction in nitric oxide, like a nitric oxide deficiency, there was a decrease in muscle mass, decrease in hypertrophy, but also a decrease in muscle cross-sectional area. So the muscle literally shrank. Now, what's more concerning about this is they saw a reduction in mitochondrial biogenesis. That's basically, they were no longer forming new mitochondria. So we think muscle mass, okay, yes. But what about the mitochondria? What about the actual powerhouses that are making that mass functional? So when we have a reduction in that as a result of nitric oxide deficiency, we're losing functionality too. So 
we're only potentially improving this by taking an inexpensive NO2 supplement. Okay, now whether it's something like Citropeak, whether it's something like straight up arginine, whether it's something like citrulline malate, or whatever, if you go to your doctor and you get Tadalafil, however you wanna do it, I think there are some potent reasons to try it. Anyhow, let's move on. This next one is new and emerging stuff. And it's a little bit interesting because we have to look to the future a tiny bit, but I think this is where research is going. I'm talking about taurine. Now what's cool with taurine is we're starting to see data come out that our body produces it to essentially help us do more. So there are two reviews, one in the Frontiers of Physiology and one in the International Journal of Sports Nutrition. So when we look at all the data together, essentially what they found is that when a muscle is heavily stressed, we seem to produce taurine. So they saw in situations of high stress, taurine increased, specifically in damaged muscles. So in other words, if I go and I beat the crap out of my bicep and damage that muscle, if you were to take a chunk of that bicep, you would see elevated amounts of taurine in that muscle, but maybe not in my pinky toe. And the point is, is that we're seeing that taurine acts as an endogenous antioxidant. So it's actually protecting that muscle, allowing it to work harder and recover faster. So we're seeing in the data that there's a short term ability to improve like severe intensity. So when you are really pushing it, really, really pushing it, taurine might help you push it a little more, but more so it's less about intensity and more about volume. Usually you're limited by volume with intensity, right? They kind of go hand in hand. You can decrease intensity, but increase your volume. But when you increase intensity, your volume is going to go down. There's just only so much money in the bank, right? But Taurine might allow you to get that intensity where you want it and squeak a little more volume out of it because you're helping natural recovery a little bit more. Now, in addition to the antioxidant pathway, we're starting to see some molecular angles in which taurine influences essentially glucose metabolism to ultimately influence genes that are associated with insulin sensitivity. So there's effects on muscle anabolism by increasing insulin sensitivity and making the muscle cells more sensitive to the anabolic signal, meaning when you have some carbs and protein, you're gonna have a stronger signal to potentially build more muscle. Now the downside that we have to think about this is that this is something our body produces endogenously. If we were to start adding in it all the time, do we sort of prevent our body from producing it? Do we overtrain? Are we messing with the natural rhythms of our body? Well, let me tell you this. You need about three to six grams to make an effective dose of this stuff. What I would recommend is only use it on your extremely hard days because you want a training adaptation to occur during training, but maybe during competition or a day that you're going for score or a PR, and you're not looking for so much adaptation as you are just a number, then that's the time to take it. And you preserve it for that, you might notice a more market effect. Okay, this next one is one that I've done a full scale long video on, but I'm gonna do a summary here because this one is great for newbies. I'm talking about HMB. Maybe you've seen my video out there before. It was a very unbiased breakdown. But with HMB, you're essentially looking at like building blocks of leucine in the first place. Leucine being that primary amino for muscle mass. So there was an interesting study that demonstrated an increase in hypertrophy, increase in strength, increase in resistance to fatigue, overall increase in recovery, but it was much stronger in untrained individuals, not so strong in trained individuals. And the reason thought so to be behind this is that when you start getting used to training, your level of proteolysis, how much do you kind of break down, goes down because your body becomes more efficient at maintaining your muscle. When you are a newbie, you start lifting weights, your body's like, ah, break it down, break it down. And your proteolysis is a lot higher. So introducing HMB or even leucine for that matter is going to have a more dramatic impact at stopping that proteolysis, that muscle breakdown. So again, the most important thing is stopping breakdown. Everything else is just a little icing on the cake. So HMB is a tough one because at the end of the day, you could probably get a similar effect with just leucine, but for newbies, it might be a squeak better than leucine but it's an inexpensive supplement and you can find water that's infused with it that you can sip on all day. It's pretty straightforward. So I would recommend it if you're a newbie, but then phase it out after you've been training for a while. And the last one is a very interesting one. And I think this is a very important note. It's one you wanna consider cycling, not taking in all the time. It's beta alanine. Now, if you're used to taking a pre-workout, nine times out of 10, you're gonna have beta alanine. So maybe you should cycle your pre-workouts. You might get a tingly feeling from it, but the real reason what's going on, why we wanna use beta alanine, is it increases cardicine, 
And when you increase carnosine, you increase the buffering of lactate and hydrogen ions, which arguably are what give you the burning sensation. So it changes the pH of your muscle as you increase that burn. Carnosine helps buffer that, essentially making you push further. There's a big caveat though. Well, first of all, let me explain the data. The Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research did publish a paper, four grams versus placebo. The four gram group was able to push it further. They did have more hypertrophy, uh, but there wasn't a ton of difference in strength. Now, what this tells us is that it's not gonna help you with brute strength, but it might help you with that hypertrophy range where you normally get the burn. So if you're going for brute strength, like one to three reps, you're fatiguing just like hitting a wall versus burn. Think about the difference of what it feels like to train in 10 to 15 reps. It's like, ow, that burns, I'm pushing through it, compared to one to three reps and you're pushing, you're just like, ugh, I can't do anymore, right? No real burn. So it's helping you deal with the burn. What's the problem with this? Lactate is a signaling device. Lactate triggers our adaptation. So it helps us facilitate new change and growth. So again, it's one of those you wanna take just when you are pushing it hard and you're going through phases where you want a little more hypertrophy, and then you should cycle off of it so you don't lose the ability to buffer naturally. Whether or not that's true, I don't know, but it doesn't seem like a risk I'd like to take. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.